started my career in an investment bank. The yeah, first uh, sort of part of my career came out 2001, just before the dot-com sort of um, happened. So I'm a bit older than you guys, I guess. And so uh, did my first venture in the UK, sold at 2004, second exit 2008, when I was able to sell founder shares of my company to Lehman Brothers, just before they collapsed. That was just pure luck. And then I was kind of uh, uh, okay, whilst I witnessed this whole financial crisis unfolding, right? which was rather traumatic if you come from Wall Street, it really makes you think something is seriously wrong here, right? With this heavily intermediated, centralized sort of financial system. So it took me a while, I took my time, nothing was happening, everybody was sitting on their hands, uh, sort of post 2008, right? And I did all the things one does when one has an exit, sort of sail around the world, you know, that sort of thing. And only, uh, what, a couple of years ago did I get involved with the crypto community, you know, Bitcoin meetups, then the early Ethereum meetups, you know, like in San Francisco, when Vitalik came to speak, it was like 20 people. That was it. That was 2014 still, right? And so I got involved and that's how the idea came But okay, if you, if you look at, at value in the world, where is value in the world residing? You would think it's residing in coins and notes, which, you know, it is partially, but most of the stuff is actually wrapped in a legal container called the private limited company. It's not the sum total of listed companies. You would think it's the sum total of the market capital, the New York Stock Exchange, the Shanghai Stock Exchange, and so on. Actually, that's only a fraction of the overall value in the world. For instance, this building, I bet, is wrapped in a private limited company. That building over there is wrapped in a private limited company. The airplane you flew in when you came in from Berlin is wrapped in a limited company. So we kind of did a back of envelope calculation, 85% of the world's value is wrapped in a limited company. But guess what? We're still using very medieval processes to work with these limited companies. We use paper. It's paper and paper and more paper. It's big paper mills, right? So we're basically using stuff like seals even still. I bet in Germany there's still documents that have like a sort of a seal wax type thing. That goes back to the popes, right? When the pope with his ring was sort of printing his seal on a wax you know, uh, a piece on, on, on the paper. So I think the, the, the insight that I gained from hanging around the Ethereum communities as a business guy, not as a coder, right, was, hey, surely we can use this now for the first time to rip out all of this analog friction and this legal entropy that's just crazy and, and just replace all these wet signatures with, with the, the private key, right? And when you do that, what you actually can do is you can represent private company shares, right? On this blockchain, you get a wallet, you get a wallet, you, every shareholder gets a wallet, or anybody involved with a company gets a wallet. And then you link that to the identity of the shareholder or the director, you let them do everything they need to do in their company with that private key. And it's a bit like, again, when you explain that to laymen, you kind of go to analogies like the MP3. So there was a time when you wanted to listen to music, you had to bring in the whole orchestra, right? In Mozart's time, you had to just get the whole thing in, have them set up and play the cello and the piano, or whatever. Then, you know, the, the, the black vinyl was invented and wow, we could reproduce music just like putting the disc there. Then the CD came, now I bet you're no longer using CDs, you're using all your music sits as an MP3 file. So what you do is by digitizing company shares, you also make them a lot more easy to transfer. You make them cross-border. So you start opening up what used to be I'm a Dutch company in Amsterdam with Dutch investors, documented by Dutch law, into I'm a, I'm a, I'm a project, I want to raise funds from people all around the world. I give each of them who invests or participate a share wallet on Ethereum. So you see how this digitization will help, I think, you know, do great things. Really get projects that we all believe in, get it funded without that sort of geographical restriction that we, we had before. So that's essentially what Autonomous does. I think in the very early days that I attended some of the Ethereum meetups, Vitalik used to call it a, a, a decentralized uh, emulation of a computer running a program. And I think that's still kind of the best description of the blockchain 2.0, which is Ethereum, sort of the smart blockchain. But that doesn't help to explain it to, you know, uh, your parents, my parents, and friends who are not in the crypto space. So I think one has to call it a database, but one has to call it a special type of database where basically there's no central um, uh, uh, admin rights. 
but that the database essentially is, I call it horizontal, when I explain it to lay people, right? Instead of a sort of a centralized silo with admin rights that give you access to it, where you can then also change data if you want to be malicious about it. It's, it sits horizontally on everybody's computer and it's sequential in the sense that what it's all about is that the transactions on the database um, move in an irreversible sequence. And because there is no central access right, it's also tamper-proof. So those are kind of the characteristics that I typically highlight. So the way I see it is that, um, that there used to be a, a, a way of having trust amongst participants in a certain system as a result of physical proximity. So the example that comes to mind is the, the level of direct democracy in some Swiss villages, which is still kind of praised as a, a model for direct democracy. Now, the reason why you can achieve that is because you have a sort of a close commune in a close physical space that can vote on, for instance, resolution. They all go to the market, to the town square, and they vote. What, what blockchain allows you to do is that scale that horizontally. And so you can replicate that same sort of trust that you find in, in closed communities, but you can replicate it by having participants who are distributed all over the globe. For instance, in the company setting, which is what we're doing at Autonomous, you can effectively have shareholders who have wallets all over the globe, invested in your company, vote on a resolution in your company, knowing that the private key that they're going to be using is effectively linked to their identity and their holding of shares in your company. So you're replicating that level of trust that otherwise would be very difficult to achieve. And I think that's a key benefit. That's going to help us you know, make things possible. That's going to help us insert liquid democracy in a lot of processes that currently have just no participation. I think you've got to look a little bit at the, the genesis of, of Bitcoin, right? So Bitcoin was kind of the first and perhaps most obvious use case of this, of this blockchain where people wanted to send each other digital cash. I mean, cash has always been sort of the, the, the dream of the crypto anarchist, right? Sort of the digital cash. And so when, when you make digital cash possible, possible you, the, the first concern is that it just goes from A to B and you have a state change from A to B. I own X number of Bitcoin, I want to send it to you in, in, in exchange for whatever it may be. As a result, there is really no need to make that blockchain that, that powers the rails that allow that peer-to-peer -peer transfer to make that smart in any way. You just want the physical, the, the, the digital cash to move you know, from A to B. However, if you want to achieve more than just that, right, um, then you have to work with the smart contract functionality on Ethereum. I know they're trying to engineer with blockchain as well, with sidechains and a number of things, but I do believe that Ethereum lends itself a lot better to do that sort of smart um, uh, transactional work and functionality that you want to achieve. So a simple example could be, uh, again, uh, sort of on, in, in the company setting, you're a founder in a company. You have taken money from investors, Investors will typically say, Carl, we want you to hang around for two years. You're a key man in the company, right? Very simple smart contract can basically put the lock on your shares. So you sit there with your founder shares in your wallet and you would want to maliciously transfer it out without anybody knowing. Well, guess what's going to happen? You're going to enter your private key and it basically is going to go, er. so essentially you can't transfer out because you put a, a lock on your founder shares. And you can make it work such at the smart contract level that when that lock expires, i.e. when you're out of your key man provision, which is a very standard provision in any shareholder agreement, because if you leave the company, the company is kind of done for, right? You're the, the founder. So when that expires, you basically have a, a, a clock ticking in the smart contract that when it expires, you can start transferring out your shares. Very simple smart contract, but you can't do it on Bitcoin. Let me make one thing very clear. We would all perhaps love to live in a world where you could just incorporate companies by issuing tokens at the digital layer, right? However, we still live in a world where if you want to gain adoption, right, for your technology, you're going to have to build that bridge between the analog world, i.e. the paper-based world and the digital world. So what is important to us is that when you do have your, your shares sit in that share wallet, they actually link to real-world jurisdictions. Right? Singapore is where we started, Hong Kong, UK, we're going to Cayman Islands, we maybe go to Estonia, we may go to the United States, Delaware and so on. You actually with us order a company like a pizza, I like to say, fully online, easy, 
And then once you've done that, you get into this dashboard and you find your shares in that wallet. Now, why is it important? Because when you have that anchor with the real world jurisdiction, some wrecks will kick in, right? Inevitably, some wrecks will kick in. Now, the good news is that there is still one space where regulators pretty much leave us to do whatever we feel like doing. It's called the private company. So you and me today, we can incorporate a private company as long as we don't incorporate it for the purpose of drug dealing or child pornography, whatever it may be. So an illicit purpose, we can agree anything we feel like agreeing. And the court infrastructure will very much respect, at least in Anglo-Saxon countries, what you and I have agreed. This is like holy, right? This is a, 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 a freely entered agreement with two, two willing people. Right? And so we can pretty much agree whatever we feel like agreeing. Not just the name of our company, which has a number of checks, but for instance, how are we going to transfer shares? We can agree that we can only transfer shares by entering our digital key, our private key on the Ethereum blockchain, for instance. There is no regulator saying you can't do that. So it's actually rather beautiful that we still have at least one space where we can pretty much do whatever we feel like doing, and it's a private company. So we don't have that many wrecks you know, kicking in for us. Here's kind of where we feel there is massive friction, right? If you look at the life cycle of a company, there's a bit of friction on incorporating, getting established. But then as you sort of graduate in, in, in life and your company at some point will need outside funding, right? This is just, again, a, a case of legal entropy with lawyers charging, you know, outrageous fees for basically replicating templates of what they've done in the past. Print screen, slot in your company name, charge you $10,000, $20,000, $30,000 for it. We don't think that that is necessary. If you can insert blockchain into that, knowing that the processes, the legal mechanics can be perfectly replicated in a secure way, tamper-proof way. And so what we've done is we basically uh, took our own documentation for which we still had to pay the old-fashioned lawyer fees as a result of our investors and we said look we're going to amortize these now in this digital platform you do your whole funding round online and almost as a confirmation ticket like a trade ticket we populate these big legal agreements that people still somehow want as a backup to get legal validity so you pay in our dashboard you pay 80 dollars a month to subscribe to get access but you get like $30,000 worth of legal uh, documents. So we actually now see people doing these funding rounds with uh, pretty standard templates because these templates are pretty, these, these, these funding rounds are pretty standardized in terms of documentation. The term sheet is pretty standardized, the shareholder agreement is pretty standardized, share subscription agreement. Without wanting you to go too much detail, it is pretty much a standardized process. And where you want to tweak it a little bit, you can tweak it. So what we're not looking to automate is the human aspect of negotiation. So you go to an investor and say, I feel my company is worth 5 million. The investor says, no, I think it's 4 million. And you figure that out. But once you've agreed on the headline terms, we make the whole legal mechanics frictionless and we insert technology into that. There's extra functionality that we still want to add. For instance, now this month we're adding a smart contract on share option schemes, which is helpful for entrepreneurs. Um, th there's two ways we want to scale. One is that, yes, geographically, we want to add more jurisdictions, right? We feel that there's a number of jurisdictions with, where, which are in demand for which we don't cater. And I think the ultimate price may be the United States. I know a lot of in the, in the crypto community want to stay clear of the United States. We feel like Delaware is still a very important place for incorporation, a very liquid and deep domestic market, but also a lot of foreign attention, right? So we may go to the United States after our A round, which is sort of the next, uh, next summer. And uh, we also want to make sure that we don't build a product that only works for startups. As a business guy, I don't think it's a good idea that you build a business that purely relies on startup clients. Why? They tend to disappear, unfortunately. There is that attrition rate and they tend to be poor, right? They don't want to necessarily pay institutional type fees. We believe that our technology could help VCs, for instance, sort of press the button, have a fund set up and get your fund somehow invested by the limited partners that typically come into a fund and then deploy the capital of the fund towards startups. So there is that institutional demand that we want to fulfill. And so we want to be, for instance, in Cayman, where a lot of these VC funds are set up. And we want to make sure that we can get sort of an institutional tier to make everything within that fund work on blockchain. So we have, for instance, one of the largest mutual fund houses in the United States who took a stake in our seed round. And I was very surprised. This is a very traditional state asset manager 
who manage, I think, trillions of dollars. So we're not supposed to name their name, that was part of the deal, but it's a very recognizable name in the United States. But they said, Han, what you're doing with Autonomous, this technology could help us with redemption subscription of shares in our mutual funds and this whole thing. And I think that's absolutely the right analysis. This whole mutual fund space, how we, how we pool um, resources, not just money, but also um, talent behind a project and behind a company is gonna change forever as a result of blockchain.